Yeah, hey, this is Eric Visser. I just jumped on. Not sure if you guys can hear me or not. Loud and clear. Morning, Eric. All right. Hey, John. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, Mandy, do you want to do the roll? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Here. Ms. Kennedy? Here. Mr. Peterson? Present. Mr. Constant? Here. Mr. Dunbar? Here. Ms. Zalatel? Here. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Here. Chairs, you have a quorum. And for non-committee members, Mr. Rivera? Present. Mr. Perez Verdia? Ms. Allard? Ms. LaFrance? All right, good, thanks. Um, so uh, agenda in front of us, any changes to the agenda from anyone? I'll watch chat for um, people want to be in the queue. OK, hearing no changes. So first up is um, marijuana establishments, uh, Alaska Rhyme. And Mandy, do you want to do the license info? Yes, thank you. Um, so for AK Rhyme, this is for a new manufacturing facility. Um, for their license review, all of the general requirements were addressed in their operating plan. Um, they did have taxes, fees, or fines found due, and so you will see that as a condition. However, they have already paid them, so that's um, been taken care of. Um, so all of the safety and security requirements were addressed in their operating plan as well. And for the manufacturing specific requirements, uh, they addressed those also. So aside from the taxes, fees and fines, there were no extra conditions added um, for the are recommended for the license. And as I said, that one has also been taken care of already. All right, thank you. And um, planning staff, is Brian there? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a request for a special land use permit for a marijuana manufacturing facility within an I-1 district. Uh, the site is located southeast of the intersection of East International Airport Road and A Street, and the proposed establishment will be located within an existing industrial and commercial use structure. Uh, of which approximately 1,334 square feet of available interior space will be dedicated to manufacturing operations. And uh, proposed hours of operation are going to be 7 a.m. until 5 p.m. seven days a week. Uh, in, in, for public notice for this case, the planning department did mail out 151 public hearing notices and as of the uh, finalization of the staff packet, no responses had been received, but we did receive a, a comment from the Midtown Community Council, um, which indicated uh, neutrality on the matter, so they didn't have a specific opinion for or against. Uh, possible revisions to the site plan may be necessary prior to final approval, and those items uh, are shown in the draft AR as conditions seven and eight. Um, there's no underlying neighborhood or district plan for this area, but the use is consistent with the Anchorage 2040 land use plan. And the provided site plans do not show any major alterations to the building facade or structure that would make it of dissimilar character scale or size when compared to surrounding structures. Uh, thus, the planning department does recommend approval of the special land use permit uh, subject to the conditions as stated in the staff report. And right, I'd be thank happy you. to take any questions. I wonder, do we have um, um, someone from the company in, on the phone here? Yes, this is Kyle Denton, um, managing owner. OK, is Ms. Welton there? Yes, I'm here too. OK. OK, so you can um, pull up to the table if you'd like. And um, I'm watching chat, so if someone wants to chime in, go ahead and just um, 
kind of type your name in chat or something and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, so from committee members, any questions on this one? Okay, I don't hear anything. I have a couple questions. And uh, one, I, I guess to Mr. Danton or, or Welty. So in this, are, are you, you are connected with the operation on the other side of the street, is that correct? Yes, yeah, we're just uh, moving across the street to this location to expand our operation a little bit on the manufacturing side. We already have a manufacturing license operating across the street on the other side of A Street. Okay, and are you like taking over that whole Alaska tent and tarp building, but only part of it is for the manufacturing? Correct. We're going to have a business license and a warehouse, um, a storage warehouse in in the rest of it. Okay, and then so I was looking here. So on page three of the state application, it says that Alaska Frost and Isidore are on the same property, but they're across the street. And, it, and on that state application, it gave 100 um, international airport roads. So it's at which is the 100 international airport road? Is that the existing operation or is that that Alaska tent and tarps old spot? No, I'm. Uh, I'm not sure. Let me see if I can pull that up. It's not it's not the same property we uh, currently AK Rhyme has an operation in the same building on 5200A Street, which is across the street, which is co-located with AK Frost and Isidore. This this building is just going to have AK Rhyme in it. Hmm. Yeah, it was odd. So it, it was anyway. It reads different on the yeah, look at page three of the state app, and it says they're all on the same property. It didn't quite make sense. And then. Um, the owner, it's a little unclear, and, and part of the write-up, it talks about Blackstone and other licenses that Blackstone owns. And on page 185, it says Blackstone investment in the biennial report is Kyle Denton and David McConnell, each owning 50%. But on page 163, there's Kyle Denton at 50% and then nine other members. So did ownership change? Yeah. What's going on? Yes, ownership changed. Um, Dave McConnell sold his 50% to the other group. I still maintain my 50%. Um, the, we just never really changed the operating agreement. I, I'm i not sure which. The so Kyle, yeah, Kyle, if I can jump in. The biannual reports, this is Jana Waldstein, the biannual reports don't change. So even if, you know, the ownership changes later. That when you file a biannual report, you file it as of the current ownership. So you only file those biannual reports every two years. So that's why you see the latest biannual report shows the mm -hmm. past ownership, but the um, ownership has been transferred and changed and gone through the muni process um, and also gone through the state process. Okay, so so the next biannual report would have the new owners then? Yes, in 2021. Did, so did, did the ownership change, did that trigger come into the assembly? It did. did. We, we did, okay. So just to remember, okay. Yeah, it's a controlling change because it's, you know, 50%. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thanks for that. So any, uh, again, for, uh, I guess, any assembly members, any questions in the Felix? Okay, so what do we want to do with this, folks? I have moved to recommend. I'll second. Okay, any opposition? Okay, hearing none. Okay, so um, Mr. Denton, so you're probably aware. So we'll when we take this up at the um, assembly meeting on Tuesday, um, we'll just mention that we discussed this at this meeting and that the committee recommended approval, but you know it's up to vote of all 11 of us to approve it. So I'd hope yeah. you'll be available at that meeting and by phone or some way. Absolutely. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, next one is Primo, a retail establishment. Mandy, do you wanna 
Yes, Tell thanks. Um, so for the license review for Primo, this is for a retail license. Um, they addressed all of the general requirements in their operating plan. There were not any taxes, fees, or fines found due. Uh, they also addressed all of the safety and security requirements in their operating plan. Um, one of the comments from the health department was just that they would need their empty and full shelf inspections prior to operation. Um, and that kind of goes along with all of their other final inspections. Um, and then the retail license specific requirements were also addressed. So there were no extra conditions recommended for the license. All right, thank you. And uh, Ryan, this is yours as well. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is uh, Ryan Yell with the Planning Department. So this is a request for a special use permit for a marijuana retail sales establishment within an I-1 district. Uh, and this uh, establishment will be located northwest of the intersection of Old Sewer Highway and Brandon Street. And the proposed establishment will be within an existing commercial light industrial strip mall uh, type structure and the licensed premises area will be approximately 1,474 square feet. Uh, proposed hours of operation will be 10 a.m. until midnight, seven days a week. And on June 1st, 2020, the planning department did mail 124 public hearing notices for this case. One response and opposition from the general public has been received, um, and we also receive it, received an additional comment from the Old Seward Ocean View Community Council indicating opposition to the approval of this case. Uh, there are possible revisions to the site plan that may be necessary uh, prior to final approval, and those items are um, listed in condition number seven of the draft AR, and they shall be resolved with the traffic department. Um, and similar to the previous case, there's no underlying neighborhood or district plan for this area of town, uh, but this use is consistent with the parcels designation within the Anchorage 2040 land use plan and the provided site plans do not show any major alterations to the building facade or structure that would make it of dissimilar character scale or size when compared to surrounding structures. Uh, thus, the planning department does recommend approval of the special use permit subject to the conditions as stated in the staff report. Uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, I just is um, Mr. Ferguson online? Yes, I am, sir. Hey, hi. Okay, so uh, Mr. Ferguson, this is probably your first round with one of these? With a retail store, correct. Okay. Um, did, did you listen in on a review of the first license? I had a license previously from Houston that I had to rescind due to the problem with the property, but I haven't no. had an active license yet. Dan, he's asking if you listen. This is Jana. Sorry, through the chair. Dan, he's asking if you just heard the previous review and the questions that were asked. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he's asking if you're familiar by listening to the last uh, application. Yeah, I am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, from committee members, are there any comments on this one? Hi, John. It's Meg. I asked to get in the queue, please. I'm sorry. So I'm, I think I'm on. Um, I might not be looking at chat properly here. Um, so Meg, uh, go ahead. Um, thanks. Um, could you detail just briefly the um, community concerns um, for me? Um, and then uh, if uh, the applicant has any particular response, I'd just like to know a little bit more about that. Mr. Ferguson, uh, to, to the chair, oh. this is Ryan Yell. Was what, Meg? Was that question directed to the planning department with the applicant responding, or is it directed to the applicant? The first. Thanks, Ryan. Okay. Um, yeah, I can kind of give a brief overview of the comments that the planning department has received, and then um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be useful to get more detail from the applicant. But the Old Seward Ocean View. Community Council is generally opposed, um, to my understanding, generally opposed to all marijuana within their Community Council boundaries. Um, they did recognize that the applicant uh, followed all proper procedures and reached out to them um, in, a, in an appropriate manner 
and they, they felt satisfied with that process, but it seems that there's general opposition um, regardless of operating plan or uh, who the applicant is to, to all marijuana within uh, their community council boundaries. Okay, great. That, that satisfies my curiosity. I, I don't need an applicant response. Thank you. Um, well, through the chair, Mr. Whittleton, if I could just make one comment. Uh, sure, go ahead, Ms. Welting. Thank you. Um, so this is, you know, actually the first time we've seen this, this letter from the community council was in the staff report. You know, it, this was my first uh, COVID hosting community meeting. And so, you know, I appreciate the, you know, the concerns and comments about difficulty hearing, but we did, I mean, we had an hour and a half call and it was very robust. On April 28th, I actually sent my draft um, community summary to Steve, the, the president of uh, Ocean View, hoping to get like some commentary like, hey, do you think these numbers are correct? You know, because I kind of had to estimate and I had my, you know, assistant sitting with me till seven o'clock at night, you know, making sure that we understood, you know, who people were and where they were calling in from. And we, we you know, really did our best on that. Um, I would say, you know, so I, I wish he would have responded like, hey, we didn't think the amount of participants was exactly correct. You know, we think we had more of a lower number and that would have been nice communication to have. Um, I'm also kind of disappointed that the community council didn't invite um, the applicant, despite like our outreach and continuous communications or attempts to communicate to the May 20th email uh, community council meeting, because that would have been nice to, to be able to, um, you know, answer questions at an actual community council meeting. Um, Dan has made some contact with other leaseholders in the mall. A lot of them are closed. It's COVID, um, you know, so there's not a lot there, but he has, you know, reached out to some and, you know, they have concerns, but they're, you know, there, there are concerns, but I mean, he did reach out to some of those people that also have businesses in the mall. Um, we did address security concerns, the parking and the entrance and the exits. I, I tried to explain to the group on the different Zoom mediums that we use for our community meeting that there will be um, traffic is going to have to review the site plan. It's going to have to meet Title 21. There were concerns that they were going to only consider the current parking load, um, which is reduced because of COVID. And I assured them that wasn't the case, that they would um, consider the parking as the code requires it on normal operations. Um, and I, I don't know what was unclear about the expansion of a retail shop. Um, we made it really clear that this is this suite is the boundaries of the licensed premises. If those boundaries changed, we'd have to go through a whole nother process and um, have another community council meeting. And we also explained that this facility wasn't because um, there was concerns about on site consumption. We explained that this there was no intention for on site consumption. Um, so I hope that addresses some of the concerns. Again, I'm, I'm, I am disappointed that we weren't invited to this May 20th uh, community council meeting, but um, or received any feedback from my draft when I sent it to the community council. All right, thank you. Uh, Pete, you had a question? Let me get unmuted here. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I'm very familiar with this mall. I almost moved my business into this mall about 40 some years ago. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, that's fine. I like knowing. Oh, hello, okay. can you hear me? Uh, we can't hear you. Someone needs to mute. And uh, so, yeah, that that actually the parking lot there is 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 a good sized parking lot. I I don't foresee the problems with there being enough um, enough parking spaces or enough room for for turning around or that that kind of thing. And I've been in that and had a lunch at that uh, restaurant on the corner there many times. And that parking lot is very seldom uh, full or there's always been parking sp spaces available when I've been there, I'll put it that way. But this this would be the furthest south retail license in uh, the municipality, I believe. And uh, so I, I don't, I don't, I really, I really don't have much of a question. Just, uh, I'm just not surprised that the community council uh, is, is, is opposing this. Uh, some, and, you know, the Northeast Community Council has been 
doing that type of opposition from the very beginning on licenses as well. And it's unfortunate, but uh, that's that's the, that's just the way it is. It's the reality of the situation. Thanks. Correct, and Pete. That's the furthest south in Anchorage Bowl. We have two. That's correct. So, um, okay. Well, thanks, Pete. Um, anything else from the committee? Yeah, I I have a question. I'm sorry, Chris. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem, Jana. Uh, so, was there any uh, effort by this council to provide some kind of MOU, or was it just this kind of communication that we don't agree? Well, I, like I said before, I, per, I personally didn't receive this letter um, about the opposition until the staff report. Um, so no, right. um, and no, there wasn't there wasn't any discussion of an MOU. I would have liked to propose one at a community council meeting, but I didn't. Um, you know, we didn't get an yeah, invite to this. Yeah. So effectively, what this is, appears to be is another case where. Uh, you have a community council that is not willing to participate in creating a neighborhood responsibility plan, and that's not the burden of the licensee at this point. I mean, I, I, I would just like to add that, you know, Dan is really committed to being an awesome neighbor and that, you know, one of the um, gentlemen on the phone, you know, had a really unique and you know insightful comment and he said i want you to think about how you're going to make our neighborhood better and i'll tell you that dan and i have had a lot of conversations about that comment and how um and how how he can make the neighborhood better and so he internally is planning on doing that maybe next year we can get with the community council and, and get an mou um or you know or something you know when they're more wanting to work with the applicant that would be good Okay, anything else from the committee? Okay, I just uh, I'd like to comment briefly on that community council part part of I think in general they do seem opposed to any marijuana shops or activity in the community council area, but also the way that they do their approvals of things is very slow. So they'll bring it up at one meeting kind of like we introduce things and they can't deal with it until the next meeting, which can be a month or more later. So they have the standing opposition um, in case they don't have time to get to, um, you know, a proper meeting. So in this case, I don't know how the scheduling worked. It sounds like they could have been there for a May meeting. But, uh, you know, it is, I, I do recommend, I mean, there, there have been people on the agenda talking about marijuana operations at that community council. So they, they, won't, they don't just blanket reject any discussion of a marijuana operation. So I hope that the applicants will, um, Try again, meet with them. So what do we want to do with this committee? Move to, to recommend. Approval. Or yeah, oh. recommend approval. And who's that? Austin and Meg. OK. OK, any um, opposition? OK, so hearing none, we'll recommend approval for this. Thank you. So Mr. Ferguson, you heard at the first one. We when we hit this at the meeting on Tuesday, um, we'll mention that we had discussed it at this meeting and that the committee had recommended approval, but the approval depends on the vote of the full body of the assembly. So I hope you would be there just in case something comes up. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Okay, so moving on, we have um, Benden Adams report and development services public survey results review. And I think um, Mr. Dole and Ms. McNulty were going to present this. Are they there? Bob Dole is here. Michelle okay. McNulty is here. OK, so do you want to lead us through on this? Yes, please. OK, uh, go ahead. Good morning. Hi, I'm Bob Dole. I'm the Building Official and Development Services Director. Michelle and I will be tag teaming on this because we're mission partners in terms of the uh, Bend and Adams report. The Planning Department and Development Services are distinct, but our roles are sometimes inextricably intertwined for making uh, good development happen in the municipality. Uh, so I'm Bob Dole. Uh, I've been in this position now about a year and a half. And um, Michelle, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Michelle McNulty. I'm the planning director, and I've been in this position for just over two years. So 
So I, I think an important part in looking at both Ben and Adams and public and uh, the public surveys is talking about where we've been and where we're at. Um, hopefully my uh, screen is sharing with you. I'm on the second page of the PowerPoint um, uh, slideshow that uh, we sent you as a handout. This one at the top says uh, the development DSD of Bend and Adams and public survey results. This reflects the operating environment that has been in development services since approximately time memorial on the left. What that looks like, um, for if you haven't been in there, in the picture on the left, there's a permit counter where you would first sign in to request whatever services or assistance you needed. In the summer, normally July at this time of year, you would see a line, typically four to six people that are just waiting in line to, uh, to sign in for what they need. There'd be sitting t uh, table or chairs to sit on the left. In the back left is a cashier cage that usually had one or two cash or check or possibly credit card transactions going on. On the picture on the right, you're looking at the uh, where the permit technicians do the bulk of their work. There's five stations. Uh, we have uh, authorizations for five permit technicians and they would be doing the permit uh, administration in terms of working to uh, resolve issues to issue a certificate of occupancy. Uh, working on change submittals or otherwise working with um, customers who would be sitting in those black chairs in front there. Uh, given day in the summer, you'd probably see 120 people pass, 120 customers uh, pass through the permit center. And a given time, probably about 20 uh, in the building, either waiting for service or getting served. The um, At that time, maybe 10% of our submissions for permits uh, were online. Moving on to slide three, which is the DSD today, which you see on the left. Basically, the direct uh, customer interactions uh, no longer happen. You see several baskets there that uh, is organized for different sorts of documents you would drop off for any of the departments in the building, but also planning. Uh, besides planning, we have for our permit uh, for uh, on-site issues, for licensing things. We normally have it through the summer a um, COVID FEMA funded greeter who makes sure we don't have a crowd build up there, assist individuals with figuring out what forms they may need or what basket to put stuff in. And also we'll coordinate if they need to work with a member of staff to get the right person and staff to uh, briefly meet with them to explain a nuance of how to file something. In the event staff isn't immediately available also to get a cell phone number so they can wait in their car so till we can call them in to work. In short, direct customer interactions uh, that is um, heavily influenced both the uh, public survey results as well as Ben and Adams are no longer uh, happening. Instead, if you look on the right side of the DSD today, you're seeing uh, e-plans. E-plans is an electronic submission process for building plans, which is the um, now taking up to 90% of new submissions, 10% before, 90% now going forward. Uh, we have virtual, we have gone electronic and gone very fast. Our current version of the e-plans has some issues that are a little frustrating to deal with, particularly for the customer, but we found it was the only way we could maintain um, the necessary building safety role in a COVID environment, uh, particularly before I had the plan reviewers back in the building. It enables them to work remotely, enables customers not to have to come to the building. And frankly, I think it probably saves a lot of time for all just the, the wait time and travel time that was there before. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Michelle now to talk about and flip over planning today to talk about what that looks like uh, for her, the analog from a planning perspective of where we're at. Thank you, Bob. Um, like building services and development services, uh, we're also using that front foyer, foyer area for clients to drop off uh, paper submittals, payment, or anything else that needs to be delivered. Um, if you were to continue down the hallway, you would get to the planning's front desk on a, a pre-COVID uh, day. Um, now we do have someone there um, five days a week at, during normal business hours so that that greeter can call the planner at the front desk and make sure that um, anyone who is walking in can get to the planner that's appropriate for whatever their request is. 
one of the advantages that planning has is that typically by the time someone is dropping off an application, they've already been working with a planner. So they typically know exactly who they need to call and can do a lot of their questions um, either via telephone, email, or a virtual meeting through Teams um, and not have to rely on the in-person meetings. But we do have it set up so that those that don't have that familiarity still can, can move through the process as, as easy as possible. But like Bob um, and Billing Services, we're also moving to a more electronic format. So we are now having applicants submit their applications through City View. There's a lot of advantages to this because we're able to route it directly to all the reviewing agencies, um, including the community councils and the Federation of Community Councils. And it, the information is getting um, uploaded almost immediately, which makes it more available to the general public as well. Um, this is a one kind of a one stop shop as far as um, we continue to update this. So we have the applicants application, we put our staff reports, and then as we move forward through the public hearings, the resolutions and all of the approved um, uh, documents that go with this. It also allows anyone who's interested to see when the public meetings are going to be, where they're going to be located in the time, and it also allows a forum to provide public comment. And that's all I have. Thanks, Bob. So flipping uh, specifically looking at the Development Services Department survey results, um, these started being gathered uh, as an online survey, uh, replacing the customer comment cards that were previously used by assembly ordinance in 2016. Um, the 44 respondents a year we get versus the 34,000 customer encounters a year comes over, uh, a little over one tenth of 1%. By no stretch of any uh, the imagination, or would they be considered statistically valid? They provide some comments. Many of them are written, it appears, by the same, uh, so, several times multiple ones by the same individual based on writing style, capitalization, punctuation. Also, on um, I call back anyone that's in adverse uh, that provides uh, contact info. The last two I've called back, the individual has, uh, contact info is denied that they provided it. Nevertheless, we look at it, and it is another indicator of how we're doing going forward there. But again, it is a tiny, tiny sniglet of the uh, the uh, customer encounters we have represented in them. Uh, you can see for yourself the biggest uh, issues identified there, and those uh, come up uh, have come up uh, consistently uh, in looking at the surveys since they first occurred in 2016. So I looked at these, and in talking with Drew, wanted to say, well, what are would be some of the where could we find a common denominator? What appears to be driving some of these issues? And I flipped now. We took. Um, so we took various, uh, just compared the different uh, satisfaction levels across different um, parts of the organization. And this, uh, the secret to this um, chart, looking at it in terms of the common denominator that I believe drives our level of customer satisfaction and, and shows corresponding rises and dips, it's not valuation. Uh, you can see the valuation is moved independently of those two uh, top dash lines. It's not number of permits. There is um, been a long term degradation of year of experience within the organization um, from 9.5 years in 2011 down to 4.6 today. There's various factors that have driven that. But the single biggest determinant, particularly if you look at the last four years, is the level average number of staff in a year best corresponds to what is happening within the organization in terms of customer satisfaction. When staff is lower, customer satisfaction is lower and vice versa. So uh, to answer the questions of what drives our customer satisfaction in this era, which was paper intensive, face to face intensive, it was the level of staffing. Um, and um, as I'll explain uh, for, uh, shortly, if uh, you'll see 4.5 there and 4.1 had the lower levels where there was also corresponding dips. Right now, if I looked at my staffing um, where I had the, I mentioned those five desks, right now I have 
Uh, three of those filled. One person has been there long term. The last two have been there two weeks. I have two other folks augmenting them, but you can see the levels there with um, when we dipped before. Basically, I have about 3.5 people average uh, or the average amount of uh, staffing available now. So, but for the change in business practices, we would be in a point of, uh, frankly, catastrophic failure. Um, in terms of our ability to um, take care of stuff. So back in October, we talked with you all about Bend and Adams and point to various um, areas where uh, the objectives have been met. Uh, Michelle and I are here, both being here talking to you is an example of that. Uh, and as we went through Bend and Adams, it was a great point in time, but it was a point in time. We objectives were met or other conditions changed as we went forward uh, that um, Mayor Berkowitz asked for a better, more relevant process to identify continuous improvement necessary to improve, uh, keep the development going forward in Anchorage. And uh, we're looking, uh, we're looking for a more uh, what other options are out there. In the meanwhile, though, we settled on a monthly report of what seemed to be key metrics of areas and issues and rising areas that we needed to be addressed in order to keep things going forward. Besides this uh, slideshow, you were also um, provided a uh, two page uh, document, Mayor's Monthly Development Services slash planning update as of um, 6 July 2020 or 8 July actually uh, we updated it, uh, a couple things uh, yesterday on it and this is what uh, Mayor Berkowitz reviews monthly and comes back to us with the questions where uh, things do not appear to be going well or require clarification to find out how we're addressing them. I was going to invite um, Michelle uh, turning to that separate report now to uh, highlight uh, probably, probably the key takeaways for planning and answer any questions you had as to planning on the mayor's monthly development services slash planning update. OK, Bob, just to make clear, so you're referring to this one that's got the green and the red and the yellow. Uh, July 6th. Yes, Chair, that's right. OK. Thanks, Bob. Um, so I'll do a quick overview of some of the, the planning department highlights. So as mentioned, just on the economic overview, uh, both uh, development services and the planning department are experiencing that um, construction is continuing. People are still planning, people are still submitting entitlement applications, and they're still um, submitting building permits at valuation levels that we saw last year's and in previous years, and, and they're actually rising, which is, which is um, positive. Uh, we did have a, a major transportation and land use plan for this Bernard Corridor plan approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. It will be moving on to the assembly. You'll be seeing it for introduction this month and then public hearing in August. This was a, um, a great example of public outreach. We have a lot of support from this Bernard um, Community Council and I think just overall have developed what we want to see moving forward as we do public outreach on our, on our plans. Um, the Metropolitan Tran Transportation Plan was approved by the AMATS Policy Committee. Um, the Assembly did see this document as well. This is integral to receiving federal funding for transportation projects. The next thing that we'll be kicking off is the Anchorage Trans Long Range Transportation Plan. Um, even with all this going on, we are successfully maintaining operations at almost 100% efficiency um, through the situation. And that's not just moving forward with um, changing over to a more virtual or electronic forum, but also having a workforce that's working a combined um, at home and in the office work schedules so that we can toggle their overlap to make sure that we're maintaining separation distances. Um, with the um, mayor's emergency order for temporary outdoor uses. We're seeing a great influx in um, applications for those, so both retailers and restaurant operators who want to expand their operations outside um, so that they can uh, maintain the business levels that they need to keep their doors open, but also while being responsible to the health and safety of our community. Um, zoning review, which has traditionally lived in development services, has moved to the planning department. 
Um, the zoning reviewers are the ones who implement Title 21 through the building review process. So bringing them into planning has been a huge benefit. Um, while we've always used those reviewers um, as part of our meetings as we write new code, having them in our department has allowed us to do that at a more um, just at, at a more in-depth level, not only inviting them as we write um, code and get their opinion from what they see on the ground, but it's allowing us to also cross train between our planners looking at those reviews and getting more experience to our entire department. Um, a couple more things, I think just in the workforce development, we did have a huge, uh, a huge loss to the department. Um, Vivian Underwood has retired after 20 years of service to AMATS. We are uh, backfilling that position, but that's going to that's going to be a huge loss for transportation planning. Um, but we are fortunate enough to have incredible planners that are in there. So between who we have on staff with Joni Wilm and Aaron Young and Nealon and John Cecil, I think we'll be able to get um, a new recruit up to speed. But again, those are pretty big shoes to fill. We are also now currently advertising for a much needed senior planner position. Um, this is actually a backfill position from a 2018 retirement. We did not fund the position in 2019 due to budget constraints. Um, and then we're, we had to hold off on advertising the position until after um, the all the restrictions with COVID-19 had kind of settled down. Um, and really, those are the big things from planning. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. OK, um, so is this um, as far as questions go, do you do you want to go through? Are you done with that PowerPoint, the Ben and Adams, Bob, or? I'll be going back to the Ben and Adams uh, after I also talk, speak to some of the high points of this uh, separate document uh, okay. from a development services department perspective. Okay, do um, so from the committee then, uh, does anyone have questions at this point on, I guess, any of the presentation so far? I, I have a couple. Uh, do you want to wait to the end or should I jump in on some things? Uh, this is Bob. I'll defer to the chair. Your choice. It's going to be me. So here we go. Um, it, it, so the E plan, uh, you said there were challenges for customers and 90% are through ePlan now. So what are those issues and, and are, how, how do we fix them? Uh, Mr. Chair, for ePlans, um, uh, it was not written with the uh, applicant in mind. It is not particularly user friendly. The two biggest issues with it is first, um, in order to get certain, uh, you have to run certain scripts to uh, to digitally manipulate the plans and work comments and comment and markups on them which are only, can only really be done well in Internet Explorer, um, which you can go and uh, find a old version to put on your machine. It's no longer supported by Microsoft. It's quirky with many operating environments. You can generally see the comments in other browsers, but manipulating the documents uh, that you would need to do to resolve comments and all at, is difficult. The other issue there is the version that we have um, it doesn't allow you to individually resolve comments from the given disciplines. For a complex project, you're looking at comments from architectural, structural, electrical, zoning, uh, plumbing, mechanical. The only time you can address those comments is after all of them are done by the municipality, they're bundled up and they're lobbed back to one, app, one uh, person who's coordinating this uh, submittal for the um, for the applicant who then has to farm it out to their different engineers to address those comments to bundle it back up to send it back. The lack of being able to do simultaneous um, just uh, virtual uh, back and forth between the different disciplines but having to do the bundle one way the bundle back way is a tremendous time suck and administrative burden on the applicants. The way we address that will be in my uh, next that uh, once we go back to the uh, PowerPoint slides, but where I'm re I'm looking at the process for uh, renovations to our electronic submittal programs. The next version of Evolve ePlans resolves both of these issues, the browser peculiarity as well as the um, 
the bundle having the bundle comments to send them both ways and I, I I'm working on options to address that without um, creating a undue fiscal burden what would it cost to get a new version uh, the the ver the, ver uh, the software is about 34 grand. There's also probably another 20 grand of implementation cost. These are pivotal to our ability to work in the digital environment we're going to need to for at least the next year, and I'm pursuing means to obtain that. OK. All right. Um, so now on the survey, you get very few um, to it. Basically, that's, um, I think it's just a form kind of on the wall there at, at when people go in is that correct so the uh it, I, i'm not sure it's on the wall anymore these are done online now through the uh, muni website we direct them to there to actually fill it out i think there's a copy on the wall but we don't take the paper versions anymore it's all done online so is there so the response is really low but have you like sent to email, you have emails for everybody who's come in probably. Have you ever sent out a survey, survey monkey or something like that to everybody to kind of elicit more responses? I mean, you know, I mean, sometimes you can say, oh, we didn't get a lot of responses, everyone's happy, or it's just they didn't take the time to respond. Um, so we have an email list we use uh, sparingly to avoid spamming. Uh, our base, but they have periodically in the past sent that out with uh, minimal uh, survey uh, results as well. Where the online survey, um, and I was involved in standing this up on JBear, kind of went started going out of vogue um, without incentives, probably around uh, 2010, 2012. We, we don't do uh, the buy one, get one free like McDonald's or the enter a raffle like Cabela's to get people to fill out our survey. So we still have, uh, so we have uh, consistent uh, participation with, in fact, JBear itself, where they have their interactive customer evaluations. Just it is no longer getting the participation um, across the board that it did when envisioned, you know, 15 years ago. Um, hmm. do, do you get, does Google do reviews for you? Um, we've gotten, I've seen some Google reviews out there. It isn't clear that some of them are for Anchorage, Alaska versus Anchorage, Kentucky versus uh, just some of the comments in there, but I've seen some out there. Yes. Okay. The time, I, you know, I just, looking at my experience at my business, and we don't, we have tons of Google reviews. Sometimes I can't cover uh, but it's like that's the way people do things. Yeah, there are some AHBA members and others who are not shy and the comments I get and uh, I get probably a comment a week I get back to are consistent with those survey results. People wait too long, we hear about it. We developed a friction point as we started going more electronic even before COVID in terms of applicants being frustrated that here they are in line but the uh, permit techs also have to deal with the electronic submittals or those calling in to do work. So that we already had that tension point that's reflected there. And otherwise, frankly, for me, the most useful um, submissions are the, uh, the just the direct emails because we get to go back and forth and understand it, uh, what exactly the issue was that many times with an online one-way survey, um, is lacking as to what exactly the issue was, what type of permit or what sort of application or the nature of the line or when exactly they were there. It's those follow up questions that allow for root cause analysis that um, the one way surveys are typically uh, lacking in. OK, well, that's good to know. So, I mean, you get a low response, but they're I mean, there's but they're not that useful for you in that moment. Well, they were not that useful, and frankly, now that our entire service delivery model has changed, all of our comments centered around in-person transactions that have ceased to exist. So were we having this meeting a year ago, we could talk about what we're doing with the in-person customer experience based on Bend and Adams and based on um, the survey results. That model is gone. 
Um, so to, these are more historic than anything, and we can look at them as we refine our new business practices. But uh, I don't see in the foreseeable future you're going to have folks out there who are um, sitting at those uh, uh, in front of those permit techs as they crank out a certificate of occupancy. That's done uh, at set appointments, uh, uh, you know, by phone call or online now. Okay. Oh, all right, thank you. So, um, Meg, you had a question? Um, I did, thank you. So, do you get any comments or we've heard, you know, on our side about having to kind of go back and do things uh, on both the planning and the development services side and the building side, go back and do things again about consistency, um, whether that's a lack of clarity and in instruction or different folks address things in different manners. Could you talk a little bit about what uh, the departments might be doing um, to address that? Um, and then to follow up on the kind of new hybrid approach in both planning and development services, are you, is everything kind of just coming in in an order and getting in a queue or is there a way for workflow prior to, prior to station? Yeah. Um, to you know, look at in-person stuff particular days and online stuff on other days. Thank you. Through the chair, this is Bob Dole. Uh, with your leave, I'll answer for development services. And then after that, I will pass on to um, uh, Michelle to address from a planning perspective. OK. OK, and in terms of consistency, um, I think historically that was a, a greater issue when a inconsistency is brought to my level. It is just like I briefed you back in October. We apply the IRAC approach. What is the issue? What is the rule or code provision that should be applied to it? Uh, let's have an analysis in terms of how that was applied and then let's have a uh, we'll proceed to a conclusion of where is the inconsistency and how do we fix it. So um, we apply that every time an, an inconsistency is brought to our attention. Uh, if it uh, does not run afoul of life safety issues, generally I err on the side of the uh, applicant who submitted something in good faith we dorked up. Um, uh, and uh, but um, I, I understand historically that was a bigger issue. Uh, right now, I think there's far uh, better consistency amongst the different uh, disciplines where something appears to be a, a different um, interpretation than previously done. I said we've uh, been sending out 30 day uh, notices on policy letters to get feedback. To under try to understand how things evolved in a certain way and address it that way. As to the flow, um, generally it's first in, first out. Uh, if you drop off a document, that document is going to get in the queue after it's been aged a day for um, COVID reasons. Uh, along uh, at the same point uh, in the same queue as electronic submissions, we do not differentiate between handling paper and uh, electronic submissions. The paper, frankly, is much more burdensome for us to handle and there's more delays built in. If you need to do uh, chain sheets and you come in and do it, it needs to sit aside again for those to uh, age and all. Uh, so uh, the exception to flow for prioritization um, is for those that pay for expedited uh, plan review services. For, the, or for those, they go to the top of the pile. So for a um, one I was uh, I'm tracking in e-plans today, they paid for expedited service. Uh, so it, uh, the next time, up time a plan reviewer is available in each of the disciplines requiring it, that one will be done. And then they will go back to that first in first out queue, which um, combines both sets together. And Any barring, up, sorry, go ahead. No, I was asking uh, that too. Otherwise, I was going to hand it off to Michelle. Um, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. Hi, so this is M Michelle. Um, so from the planning standpoint for consistency issue, we're doing it, you know, just a lot more um, cross cross communication in our department and to across other departments. So making sure that the long range planners who 
are more the ones who write code, are working directly uh, with the current planners who implement it through the entitlement process, and then the zoning reviewers and land use reviewers, and then also making sure that when it's um, code that ref that it refers to something like traffic or building, that we're working with those appropriate people from those departments to make sure that um, we're all using the same nomenclature and that we're consistent with any other codes that that might exist in those realms. Um, when we're having a consistent inconsistencies with uh, interpretations, we are um, developing director's memos, and those are also reviewed by kind of that same larger group of people so that we're getting everyone's perspective. So we're hearing from the zoning reviewers who have a much more understanding of what's happening on the ground so that they can, from a real world perspective, lend that for um, insight as we, we write our interpretations. And then those become available to the public on our website. Um, the zoning reviewers are also meticulous about keeping notebooks and noting down the interpretations that they're making so that it's documented so they can refer to that so that they're not only um, consistent amongst each other, but consistent each time they, they do that review. Um, as far as workflow goes, we're uh, planning is a little more tied to our reviews. We don't have an expedited uh, re uh, fee that you can pay. Almost all of our reviews, um, review times are codified. So um, we actually have certain realms we have to work in, or if it's for like a planning and zoning commission or urban design commission meeting, those deadlines are tied to specific um, hearing dates. So it's, it's a first come first serve basis. And that's all. All right, thanks. Thank you. Bag, that's no, per perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, Chris, you want to add a question? Yes, I did. Sorry, it took a minute. Um, so Bob just made a presentation about how everything has changed in COVID, the new paradigm, and that all the surveys are out of date, uh, essentially that we have a new deal. Um, my question is, um, does the uh, Home Builder Association, I know that Eric is here, I don't know if he's here in a personal capacity as a visitor or in this capacity as a member of the Home Builders Association, but I'd like to hear from them their experience in this transition and where we should be looking uh, because the Bendon Adams survey too is no longer any value. What's important I think to me is what's the actual experience of the builder because as we heard, the system is uh, lends itself toward internal review in our professionals, but not the customer. And so my question is to the customer, how can we make it better? Well, thanks, Chris. So um, I know Drew uh, is also on. And so I think Bob and Michelle, do you want to finish with this um, July 6 document and then the um, PowerPoint? How, how much longer will that take? Um, through the chair, I think uh, I did envision uh, under 10 minutes. So let's do that, and then um, Chris, I think, um, you know, if, if members of the committee have no more questions, then we'll go ahead and open it up to Drew and Eric, and perhaps they can comment on it. Would that work for you? It, you know, it's fine. We do it that way, except not in the case if we have time, because we just had an assertion made about a, a new way of business that's much better than it has been in the past. We don't know what the problems are, and so if we're going to be having this talk, we either need to do it today or schedule time to hear from the customer. Okay, it sounds like we'll have um, uh, up to 20 minutes, so let's go ahead with um, that. That way we get through this whole report. So uh, I guess Bob and Michelle, go ahead and finish on the, are we still on the July 6th, and then we'll bounce back to that PowerPoint? Yes. Through the chair, I will uh, continue briefly on the July 6th and notify you I'm going back to the um, to the uh, PowerPoint. To clarify in terms of better way of business, in a COVID environment, if we're going to continue construction activities and not follow Washington State and just shut them down, I would maintain we have the only uh, business uh, model that's available in terms of the need to shift digital rather than in person. Uh, uh, I'm sorry if I uh, uh, was kind of garbled on that part. In looking briefly at the rainbow sheet, uh, the, the, the blue, red, and yellow, 
Um, in terms of economic activity being up, valuation is up 17%. We're looking at nine subdivision agreements in the making that will put another 275 units online. So work is out there and happen. Uh, folks are investing and going forward. That's probably the single biggest takeaway I see in terms of limits on the development services department is our permit technician staff. We have one fully qualified permit technician. We have two uh, in training. They're great, but they've been here two weeks. They have a lot to learn and I'm trying to hire the next two. Um, the unemployment rate in Anchorage has not translated into an influx of qualified applicants and I've spoken with contractors the last few days who are having the same challenge. I think for these entry level positions there are other competing factors that uh, they're not motivated to apply. So that is probably the biggest takeaway I've been emphasizing that we have a significant staff uh, shortfall we need to address uh, in looking at the monthly report. Going back to the PowerPoint now, I'm going to the next slide, uh, Development Services Department done and doing. Um, our website was challenged um, just if I look at where we were a year ago. Using Rasmussen uh, funding, we did a renovation of it. We've gotten many positive uh, just call-ins and appreciations. We, with the exception of one um, constituent, we've received resoundingly strong support for the website refresh. Um, I introduced having hands, handouts that were done for actual homeowners rather than just for contractors to try also to provide more online resources to reduce the number it need to call or do other things uh, because they just couldn't find the info out there. We talked before about folks frustrated with the um, experience of coming in here and watching permit technicians handle electronic uh, documents. We started with the daily hour for those. It isn't with staffing, it really hasn't kept up with the increase in uh, electronic activity. It was a start. Ben and Adams identified a need for customer service training. I started with basic communications training of four lens, which is kind of a, a more fun, quicker version of a, uh, Briggs Meyer, if you, you're familiar with that. We've offloaded some of the e plans work to plan reviewers, uh, which is also giving them a better insight into the other, other side of the process. Remote video inspections are done by our inspectors. That's a growing area, which is in, uh, speeding up some inspections and allowing more work to get done more quickly. Uh, our customer service training we were getting through HR was initially put on hold because of the COVID shutdown. I'm going to a, um, at the end of this month, we have our first test run of that training. The caution being it's still heavily built around the in-person transactions that are not viable for uh, probably the next year in any great amount. We talked about uh, permit technician force uh, Rebuilding and uh, electronic submission renovations besides e plans. Um, our Infor system is dated. Um, there's some basic maintenance that needs to be done, um, which would turn to a real geeky conversation. We're also behind other jurisdictions that allow for greater public um, access to figuring out just playing around and modeling what a permit would cost or what would be the components of a permit for different and uh, for different activities, can a house be built on a given property, given the zoning and things like that. And we're looking for options in that regard in terms of um, what we can do. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at funding and uh, some other ways there, because the more we increase the digital access to us, the less we have to have people trying to physically reach and talk to someone, but it has to be user friendly, not impossible to find. I was going to invite Michelle to do a recap of um, then uh, where she's looking at with the done and doing and I believe uh, we'll be available for any uh, additional questions or uh, the or to proceed with the, what uh, assembly member constant requested. Great, thanks Bob. So this is Michelle McNulty again. So just some of the things that we've completed in the planning department um, filled key leadership positions. So uh, the Ben and Adam report did call for the director to have um, 
provide more of a strong leadership and uh, mentoring role, and then also filling the long or current planning manager position with a strong leader. Um, and so both of those have, have been completed. We've retooled our pre-application system um, in 2000, I think it was 18, eight, time flies. Um, we introduced a pre-application fee with that, some requirements of, of information we needed submit submitted with those requests. The outcome that we've seen is much thorough information provided at the front end of a project, which in turn, you know, that's the opportunity for us to get all of the reviewing departments and agencies at the table before a design team goes too far into designing their project um, and giving us the opportunity to have the information we need uh, to provide the meaningful feedback before they submit an information, hopefully, um, lessening the work and effort they need to do on the back end as they're they start to move on from the planning entitlement process to the building permitting process um, i spoke about moving zoning review into the plan department and the cross department collaboration um, that is um, the cross department collaboration is ongoing um, as is gathering regular feedback um, and that happens both externally and internally so checking with our user groups about different codes, whether it's in the writing of those code process or after they've been um, adopted and, and being used and getting the feedback on how that's working. Um, and we're really making a much higher focus um, on communicating long range plan goals and how they tie to what we're doing in Title 21 and the, the criteria that and the standards that come out of that and making that connection so that not only the design community understands it, but the, the community at large does. Um, we're assisting the assembly with policy development. I think the CEDC forum has been um, a great forum to, to foster that. Um, we're also continuing to provide staff training opportunities. I think one of the silver linings of COVID is that a lot more training opportunities are being made available online. So conferences like the National Planning Conference and even the ESRI Conference for GIS users have gone uh, virtual this year and they've reduced the cost of those significantly. So we've been able to take advantage of those um, those silver linings and get more training to our staff and keeping them up to date, especially as policy is changing in relation to um, racial equality and and COVID and just disaster planning as a whole. And then um, I discussed the backfill of key staff positions. And then one thing that um, we want to do is update our website and kind of mirror more what development services has done. So I'm working uh, with Robin and and Bob to fill out the similar grant request to the Rathmussen to see if there's funding available um, so that the planning department can update our website as well. And that's it. All right, thank you. Um, I just, a question, is uh, Ms. Sollard with us? Okay, I thought I saw her pop in somehow. Um, any questions from the committee? So I'd like to um, give people from the home builders and others plenty of time to talk here, but we've got also on the agenda ongoing business, the permit fee changes. And my understanding is um, from Bob and um, Chris Schutte that that's something that's not quite ready, but will be soon. Is that correct, Bob? Through the chair, we've requested through the clerk's request. office to be to have that be on the agenda for the uh, second meeting of July. Thank you. Okay, and that was Chris Schutte. Oh, sorry, okay. through the chair. Chris Schutte, Director of Economic and Community Development. Okay, so um, so that's on the agenda, but I, I think for committee members and so on, it will be postponing that till later. Any comments on that from the committee? Okay. Um, so, let's see. Who, who from, um, okay, so I guess we're opening this up to the general public now. And I know from Home Builders, we have um, uh, Eric and um, uh, Drew. Are, are there other people online who would want to comment on this? How do they speak up, Mandy? They have to star six? This is Drew. I think that I, I've been muted. I've muted myself here for the most part, but uh, maybe you can hear me now. 
Yeah, I can hear you. Let me check with Mandy. Real quick. Mandy, are others like involved here, but muted or something? Or can you see who's from the public? Um, might be I see three phone numbers. Um, they aren't muted. And then as I kind of scroll through, it looks like most people are um, good that are on team. So if you're on the phone, I don't see that you're muted. You should be good. OK, so um, uh, Drew, go ahead. Do you have comments on? We've had quite a presentation here. Would you like to comment? Yeah, I guess um, so just first off, I think that you may be down to just me. Um, we have a monthly board meeting scheduled at 10 a.m. Um, and so I think that that's where uh, most of the other folks may be. Um, and so I guess to respond to uh, Assemblyman Constance question, um, I, I think that uh, Bob has, has given an excellent presentation. Um, I think that he has successfully identified a number of both the remaining barriers. And uh, I think that things like changing the software system so that things don't need to be bundled would be a major boon to the industry and much appreciated. Um, it also sounds like I think he has uh, really heard what um, the people who were filling out the survey um, wanted to have heard. I think that there remains concern from the industry's perspective um, that some of the, you know, things like the Ben and Adams report have highlighted a, uh, a sort of role for some form of external uh, recourse. Um, you've got recommendations like uh, one of the sort of start doing within 90 days um, permitting process things was to develop an approach to gather regular feedback on performance from customers, including surveys, focus groups, and or an advisory group. So I think that that recommendation, whether or not Ben and Adams or, was applied to the same process we have now, um, I think that that recommendation remains something that the industry thinks would be relevant. Um, that when you're in sort of a negotiation or when you're dealing with people back and forth in a bilateral relationship, there's often some real value in having external recourse. Um, that I think is that, uh, again, that Bob says he follows up with people when they you know, submit negative feedback and ask to be contacted on the survey. But if that's the sort of most positive, that's the positive outcome you could hope to expect, why not just call the building official? Um, it, the, the, the sort of the mechanism doesn't seem to be serving any purpose uh, at that point um, because you could just give your feedback to the building official. Um, so I think that we don't want to dismiss that as a valuable and appreciated thing. It just d perhaps doesn't seem like it should be the only mechanism. Um, another recommendation from Ben and Adams was to clarify and begin tracking a broader set of key performance metrics so that successes, challenges, and expectations are clear and grounded in data. Um, I think that that sort of, uh, again, external sense of how things are going um, is not something that I get the sense my members uh, feel uh, is being sort of a, a strong success um, right now. Okay, can you Does hold on? Um, answer your go ahead. No, but Drew, so you use the phrase external recourse. I mean, what 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 explicitly is that? Um, I think that you know. Uh, frankly, that you, the members of the assembly, shouldn't just be relying on the department to tell you how the department's doing. Um, I think that there should be some other checks on that, and I don't think that it seems like that's been happening. So so how would that, what, what, um, what routine would lead to that? Well, if you guys were interested in reviewing these survey results and sort of tracking and trying to take action on them, I am certain that I could put the word out and get a lot more survey responses. Um, I guess I am uh, not certain of what the assembly's view of its role on these sort of things are, um, but if you view it as your role to have a building services department that uh, the building community that the city feels is, you know, uh, successfully addressing customers' needs and helping us build, um, that the assembly should have some mechanism aside from just asking the department how it's doing. Um, so whether it's this survey or something else, I'm not trying to say the survey is the bees knees end all be all. 
Um, but I think the survey fills a role we view as really important, and we don't think the survey has been being has been doing that job very well. So I might, Meg, I see in the queue, but just to follow up briefly on that with Drew. So is your point if on that survey they added a note that said the assembly will get um, verbatim comments quarterly? Is that something that would encourage people to respond more? Well, I mean, it says on the survey now that the assembly will you know, be reviewing them and there'll be a matter of public record, but it took months for me to find any of the results. Um, and I still haven't really seen what the oversight review process um, or sort of any indication that, that that process has been utilized meaningfully um, has been. OK, I see. That's a good point. Uh, Chris, you wanted to follow up? Constant. Yeah. Oh, um, I, I, I don't see that the assembly is external to the municipality, so I might choose a different term. Um, but I, I think I understand what is being suggested. And I believe that the implication of this committee meeting today and the reports we just had are that this is the venue for those conversations. And so um, it might be that what we need to do is strengthen the feedback loop. But this committee seems to me to be the example of what I think I heard separate from the label, which said something different to me altogether. OK, oh, thanks, Chris. Uh, Meg? Um, thanks. So what I, the, what I took away from that was because of the way that comments are followed up on, we're not commenting because we find the process to be ineffective. Um, we hear that on a variety of ways we accept feedback in the municipality. And I guess I would just say, as I say, you know, with camp reporting or whatever else it may be, you still need to provide the feedback or the comments. Otherwise, we don't get the data points. Um, I think we would enjoy having a robust set of comments come to us, um, even if there's some dissatisfaction with what the follow up is. And maybe that's part of the comments. Um, so I just wanted to express some a little bit of frustration there. Um, I, I hear the frustration on both sides of it, I guess. So um, and if we can address that in a way that we can be reviewing the comments more directly, um, then, then we should be doing so. But we're going to need the feedback to come in as well. Right. Yeah, I guess I would. If, Mr. If Chair, I can. Yeah, uh, Drew, hold on. Let, let's, uh, uh, appreciate yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, Drew. Let me jump in because um, I think there's a, a, a an important data point that'll help guide this conversation. Um, so, <clears throat> through the chair, uh, Chris Schutte, Director of Economic and Community Development, um, to Mr. Kaysen's point and to the points we've heard from Assembly Members Constant and Zalatel, uh, I think everyone's uh, generally in agreement. And one of the ways that this could be effective. Um, is if the, so the quarterly surveys or the, I guess, quarterly, the survey results are compiled and presented by the municipal auditor, uh, who I believe is on the call today. Um, what, something that I learned though, in preparation for today's meeting is that uh, under a previous assembly chair, uh, the auditor was informed that, that he did not want the uh, quarterly reports coming to the assembly any longer. They used to show up as a quarterly uh, information memorandum, much like most of the other municipal audit reports. Uh, and for some reason, a couple of years ago, it seems like uh, an assembly chair uh, no longer wanted to receive those. And so uh, that highlighted for us that uh, what we thought was a complete loop to close, you know, to close the loop again, uh, we should reinstate the quarterly distribution of those survey results to the assembly. Um, they, they used to show up uh, as AIMs, and uh, when uh, 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 both Drew and Assemblymember Constant asked for copies of them, uh, we discovered from the municipal auditor that they are no longer submitting them. So that would be one way to at least, uh, even if this instrument is imperfect, we could at least uh, reconnect the circuit uh, as it was originally designed. Uh, we have the current Assembly Chair with us, Mr. Rivera. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, for putting me on the spot. Um, yeah, I didn't know that this was a decision that a prior chair made. Uh, and if uh, you need my blessing to have this loop be created, 
then sure you have it. But I think there may be some other things which Mr. Constant and Ms. Zolotel are asking for besides this loop. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Constant. Yeah, I think that better than an audit that gets sent to the whole assembly in a packet of 75 or 125 items, that the audit or the report should come to the committee because this committee's mission and focus is on these issues. And so um, then maybe the committee sends it to the assembly for full review. But I think what I'm hearing is a request to have the review be more meaningful and thoughtful and the, the committee is where that can happen, I think. I, what's the sense of the committee on that? If anyone wants to chime in that, you know, if it, I mean, that does make sense. And then if there are a big issue, we could move it up to the full assembly. I, you know, um, might. I think it would follow the same protocol that we have relating to uh, marijuana NOV. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what you just intimated. Right. Uh, so Meg, did you have thought on that? Um, yeah, so I think that's actually a great idea. Um, I'm wondering if that would uh, satisfy um, the users um, in their concerns um, about the utility of the process and that they would use it uh, more robustly. Uh, Drew, do you have a thought on that? Um, yeah, I think that going from the assembly not receiving uh, the outcomes, I think that it uh, makes a lot of sense why my members would feel like uh, maybe they were just spending time uh, filling out paper and throwing it in the trash. Um, and so, you know, a mechanism where we see what that looks you know that those that the, the the feedback we're spending time generating um is received and utilized um and again i don't want to dismiss the fact that i do understand and i think my members understand the feedback has been making it to the building's safety department but or development services department but i think that it's the the sense that the point seemed to be that there was there should be a communication mechanism there should be a feedback you know an iterative loop of some sort uh, that is just outside of that bilateral relationship between the industry and the department um, and so I, I do think that what you're discussing here of having the uh, the committee review these on a regular basis um, would absolutely uh, sort of check that box in a way that I don't I think that that's a mechanism a type of mechanism there has been a desire for and has been felt that that is not in existence so yes please Okay, uh, Chair Rivera, does that work? Have it come to CDC? Uh, that is fine for me. Whatever process gets the work done, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Crystal, you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess mine's a little bit more about the format of how somebody would actually do uh, some kind of a feedback. Um, it looks like everything is pretty much um, uh, done by some kind of paper survey or you do, do online and you just go through the questions. And I'm wondering if there's a way to set up just a plain old comment line where somebody could just call in, leave a voice message of some sort and just specifically outline uh, their particular uh, experience or observation and, and not have to go through some kind of a paper form whereby they're answering all these questions. Because I did notice that there were a couple of people that said, stop asking me to fill out surveys. So um, I don't know if that would make it easier if there was just some kind of a way to just leave a voice message of some sort that was, you know, it could be anonymous, but it's just a designated line where somebody could do that without having to go through that paperwork type of a process. So um, anyway, I don't know if there is, you know, if there's such a thing already, that's great. But I was just thinking to make it easier for people to actually do some kind of quick comment and feedback that might be, a, a, you know, an avenue to go down. So thanks. I think we might have an answer. Mr. Dole. Hi, Bob Dole, Development Services Director. That happens now in practice, probably about 10 messages a day left on the permit counter line of what worked or what didn't. Um, it isn't the independent uh, entity that is requested um, by AHBA, and it, do it doesn't come up in our monthly feedback meetings with them, but that's already happening in, in, in practice. Uh, those calls, so we it's a quick uh, temperature check on just things we need to tweak. Well, can I follow up on that then? 
are, sure, are sure. any of those actually recorded in some way? Are they written down then and, and just kept as a document or some kind of a log? Or do they just kind of stay in the realm of voice messaging for eternity or until they're erased? But anyway, is there any way that those are actually documented, recorded, and, and, and we would maybe have access to? Thanks. They are not documented now. I can see what we can do to pull those out of the 200 or so messages a day that uh, we get. Hmm. All right, uh, uh, thanks, Bob. So um, I think we are getting close to end of the time, and I think I've, I've got something else at 1030. I think maybe we all do. Um, Mr. Vicker, do you have a comment? Yes, sir. Eric. Maybe he's not still there. Drew, did you have something more to add? Uh oh. Karen Michelson's on the phone as well. Okay. Um, Karen, we got a few minutes if you. Sure. Uh, did you want to comment? Um, yes, um, I would love to see some kind of way to have a better dialogue other than the survey. Maybe it's just a. I don't know if it's an email. I don't I don't know what the best answer is, but um, but having just gone through ePlans experience, it was not easy. Granted, I was I did not go through the primer first, so a fair amount of it was my fault. But the other part is very clunky, um, a little hard to deal with. Um, I think Drew is doing a great job communicating with uh, building safety, and uh, I hope we can continue to do that. Um, but but finding that better uh, way of communicating would be very beneficial. And one of the comments I do have about ePlans is the staff, the reviewers, communicate with us via – they either send us um, an email or they comment back on – the permit website or they comment back on the ePlans website and it's not consistent. Uh, so when you're trying to get something done rapidly, you pretty much have to search all three of mm. venues of communication to try to find some comment back from someone. So if we can have the reviewers become more consistent, if they want us to communicate with them through ePlans, then they need to communicate back with us through ePlans. Um, I asked one of the viewers one day because um, I had I had used the email component of ePlans to communicate with them, and I asked that reviewer if they had received my emails, and they said, "No, we don't read those emails. That would take all day." And it was like, "Oh my God, okay." But so all I'm asking is is just some consistency so that we we can fall back on and know of one place to go to gather information and one place to communicate with reviewers and everybody at Building Safety, and that's that's all my comment. All right, thank you for that. Um, uh, Bob Dole, you wanted to respond very quickly? Very quickly. Normally, all response back and forth is done in ePlans. We knew Karen was having difficulty, and we were trying to work with her in different uh, venues in order to make it go easier. We may have made it harder in the process, but normally uh, for uh, users uh, who can master Internet Explorer and all, they do it all in ePlans. Uh, end of comment. Okay, thank you. So we are at our deadline here. Committee, do you want to extend or do you want to wrap it up? I can't stay, John. This is Meg. I've got another thing. Yeah, likewise. So, okay. So um, move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Any Second. opposition? Okay, well, thanks, everybody. I think we have more to discuss on this. This has been very helpful, though. Um, so we may continue this um, to another meeting. Uh, thanks, everyone.